Welcome back Guardians. This one piece of lore from the Witch Queen expansion foreshadowed Rasputin's involvement with Neomuna, the Neptune city. And finally, week 5 of Season of the Seraph seems to confirm our suspicions. The code name Nefale Stronghold is the Neptune city of Neomuna, and Rasputin has the information we need to find it. I don't want to cover just what happened in the story during week 5 of Season of the Seraph, but rather give you a full recap of the last 5 weeks of lore for this season. So if you've just not played this season, or not listened, or been on holidays, this video is for you. Surprisingly, these videos take a lot longer to make than a standard law video because I have to scrub through every piece of dialogue through each week, which is surprisingly a lot. So any support in the form of likes and comments is greatly appreciated. Also note that I write these scripts from the perspective of each week, so you can follow along in the journey of how the story unfolds. That being said, you can skip ahead to any week using the chapters feature. Let's begin. Week 1. Season of the Seraph starts with a cinematic from Anna Bray briefly recapping Rasputin-related events, like his reactivation, blowing up the Almighty, and the arrival of the Pyramid Fleet. Rasputin tried to take on the Dark Fleet and was instantly taken out. What we saw in-game was his systems going dark, but off-screen we learned that Anna saves as much as Rasputin as she can by putting him into an experimental engram. We also know from the lore that Rasputin is just sort of holding on within the engram, and so Anna's current objective is to transfer Rasputin into an experimental exo chassis. She has not found the solution to this transfer process yet. Following the cinematic, we get an in-game cutscene of Anna Bray with Osiris. By the way, if you are new this season, Osiris was previously in a coma after losing his light when Sagira sacrificed herself against Zivarath's High Celebrant. Savathun took Osiris' place and later returned his comatose body. At the end of last season, Season of Plunder, Osiris was revived from his coma when Mithrax distilled darkness from the body parts of Nezarek. Okay, and now I'm beginning to see why people have trouble getting back into the destiny. Anyway, Osiris is back now after the Nez Cafe, which also helped remember Savathun's memories. And one memory specifically caught the attention of Osiris, and that was a vision of Neptune and a secret power hidden there. In the in-game cutscene, Osiris speaks about the vision of Neptune, and more specifically, a city. Even though in Season of Plunder, Osiris referenced a secret power, he now specifically is interested in the city located on Neptune. Hidden agents have already gone to Neptune to investigate his vision, however they have not found anything. We of course know the city is there, and know that Osiris' vision relates to Neomuna because of all the marketing material for the next expansion, Lifefall. But as of right now, Neomuna remains invisible to the outside world. After Osiris finishes ranting about his vision, he takes a crack at Anna for not yet solving her Rasputin problem, specifically how to get him out of the engram and into the exo frame. Anna mentions Rasputin is degrading and dying within the engram, which we already knew as she previously went into Rasputin's mindscape and found a faint glow amongst the bramble, sort of suggesting Rasputin was just holding on. He was alive, but barely. Osiris doesn't specifically want to help Anna or Rasputin because he wants Rasputin back as a warmind. In fact, in previous expansions, he's quite distrustful of Rasputin. However, now Osiris is interested in restoring Rasputin because Rasputin's memories may hold the information Osiris needs to discover the city on Neptune. Considering Anna Bray has failed in all of her attempts to transfer Rasputin to the Exo, Osiris suggests a risky plan, enlist the help of Anna's grandfather, Clovis Bray. So, there are two parallel storylines happening here. The first, save Rasputin by transferring him into an Exo body with the help of Clovis Bray, and the second, use Rasputin's knowledge to understand Osiris' dream of Neptune, which of course will lead us to Neomuna and the next expansion, Lightfall. Now, we sort of already have some information about Neptune. When the new dungeon released this season, Spire of the Watcher, we received a bunch of lore about how Neomuna was created. See my video for more details. I will link it in the description and in the card in the top right hand corner. But essentially, Neomuna was founded by an AI called Soteria from the Echo Project. Soteria was trapped in the dungeon Spire, but before being trapped, she created a sub mind to pilot a ship that would eventually land on Neptune in the wake of the collapse. That being said, I assume we will get some further information about Neomuna this season as we attempt to restore Rasputin. Right, back to week 1 mission. 
we touch down on Europa to find Clovis Bray and his facility under siege by Zivu Arath's forces, primarily Wrathborn from House Salvation. Of course, we want to stop the invading forces because we need Clovis Bray to help us restore Rasputin. Anna and Asaras briefly chat about Eremis, and although she is technically on the same side as Zivu Rath, both Zivu and Eremis work for the Witness, Anna sort of implies that Eremis wouldn't so easily allow her house to be corrupted by the Cryptoliths. Ever since Eremis returned to Destiny's story, Bungie has been hinting at her betraying the Witness, and I do think this adds to the theory that Eremis could still turn and become an ally of the city. As we battle through the Clovis Bray facility, we get a taste for the power of Zivu Arath, primarily when a death tongue channels Zivu Arath's battle song, which suppresses your light abilities. What is also pretty scary is that the cryptolifts also corrupt both mind and mechanisms alike, resulting in the lab's protocols cannibalizing themselves, according to Anna. Seems like Zivu's will for war extends into machines. Maybe this will be important later for Rasputin and a Zivu showdown. As we enter the giant Clovis head area where Clovis is housed, Osiris informs us that our enemies are not just trying to access Clovis's information, but rather submit Clovis and control him. After clearing the area, we ask Clovis for help on restoring Rasputin. Clovis can't deny his savior complex and agrees, saying that we need his help. And of course, he's concerned about his legacy. Anna is no stranger to Clovis's self-preservation behavior, and so she mocks him. Stay tuned, I have a detailed video about Clovis Bray coming out in the next couple weeks, but for the moment you just need to know he is a complete narcissist. After agreeing to help, Anna requests that Clovis get an engram, which doesn't quite make sense considering she is having a lot of trouble with getting Rasputin out of one, but anyway, it seems like intact AI consciousness has no trouble transferring. With Engram Clovis safely tucked away, we return to the helm to find that Anna has put Clovis into the Exo chassis, the same chassis she was trying to put Rasputin in. Yeah, it doesn't sound like a very good plan, but here we are. Clovis reveals a couple of important points. He believes the Wrathborn and therefore Zivu are after Warsats previously controlled by Rasputin. Warsats are basically weaponized satellites capable of defending entire planets. There are some interesting descriptions of Warsats within the lore, specifically a Warsat using a space laser to vaporize the Cabal, but all you need to know for the moment is that the Warsats, and consequently the network that controls the Warsats, are extremely powerful and valuable, something we definitely don't want our enemies to get hold of. So now we have a third plotline. The first was to restore Rasputin, the second find out about Osiris' vision of Neptune, and now a third, stop Zivo Wrath from gaining access to Rasputin's Warsats. Clovis would also go on to reveal to us a plan to restore Rasputin, and this was huge news. I made a more detailed video about this, link below, but essentially, to restore Rasputin, we need to reintegrate sub-minds like Malahayati and Charlemagne. Honestly, the law of the submines are still a little blurry. They sort of imply that submines are partitioned copies of Rasputin's mind, even though they function independently of Rasputin and even have their own personalities. Partitioned copies that evolve separately from Rasputin. Individually, they are more advanced than the colony ship AI, but less powerful than Rasputin. But if we can collect these submines, we can use them to rebuild Rasputin and restore the missing corrupted damaged data. The confusing aspect is there is a section of law that talks about pillory stations that were designed to partition Rasputin's mind if he ever went rogue. And the implication is if sub minds exist, that would mean that Rasputin went rogue and his mind was split. But we know that that's not the case. Rasputin still exists as a whole, or at least he did exist as a whole, and sub minds also existed. So I'm just interpreting sub minds as partitioned copies, like Clovis said. That were created as resiliency measures to help restore Rasputin in the event of catastrophic failure. So now the race is on. Recover the sub mines to restore Rasputin and regain control of the Warsat network before Ziva Wrath gains access to the Warsats. The process of gaining control of the Warsat network, according to Clovis's plan, is recover the sub mines, restore Rasputin, and then give Rasputin access to the orbital station which controls the Warsat network. This is new to the law. We previously didn't know of this orbital hub, which is like a central control for the Warsats. 
That being said, if you read the description of Season of the Seraph on the Bungie website, you would know of the Orbital Hub. However, this is the first time in-game it's set. The Orbital Hub looks very similar to the Morning Star Space Station from the Deep Stone Crypt Raid. At this stage, it doesn't actually sound like Rasputin will be put into the exo frame that Clovis has, but rather Rasputin will be restored on this Orbital Hub in control of the Warsat network. Clovis also reveals the first sub-mind that we must recover, Malahayari. Malahayari was originally stationed in the Cosmodrome, and we do have some old school lore about her, which I have covered in the previous video about the sub-minds, link below. Clovis believes that the Cosmodrome sub-mind data would have been ransacked by now, and advises us to seek the off-site backup on the moon in order to recover the sub-mind data. We then receive a hollow message from Mara. She says that Eremus has yet to resurface. However, how Salvation are working with Zivu's forces to gain control over the Submines and Rasputin on behalf of the Witness. Mara also warns how Zivu is staging an invasion, forging inroads to the Ascendant Plane. Mara also confirms the location of her first Submine recovery, Malahayati back up on the moon. Okay, so as we land on the moon, we see the Wrathborn have already started their attack and attempt to claim this submine data. Mara continues to warn us of Zivu Wrath and specifically the difficulties with moving Zivu Wrath's forces through the Ascendant Plane. And while it was difficult for Zivu, the invasion and destruction of the Cabal home planet, Toro Battle, is an example of Zivu's success. As we enter the moon bunker, we are also confronted by the Scorn, which is a very subtle but important point. See my previous video for a more detailed explanation, but essentially Scorn have been used as a living communication device for the Witness, and seeing the Scorn in the Seraph bunkers around the submines implies that the Witness is using them to collect and transmit submined data, which we actually witness later in the mission. The in-game dialogue actually speaks about a Scorn interfacing with the submind. As we get closer to the vault, we get some new information about the submind Malahayati. Specifically, Malahayati was Rasputin's favorite submind and protege. As we enter the vault, Malahayati is being swarmed by the Scorn, and we recognize the boss in the area as a previous captain from Eremus. Marasov believes this is the witness punishing Eremus for her previous failure with collecting the pieces of Nezarek last season. The Witness revives House Salvation as Scorn to collect this data from the Submind, and so not only does Eremus have to witness her previous allies come back as essentially zombie Elixni, but also the Witness is sort of saying, well if you can't do it, I'll just do it for you. The basic gameplay loop for this season is that you have to get Seraph key codes to unlock Seraph chests, which contain Submind data that we can use to restore Rasputin. We do this by going to different submine locations. One location is on the moon, Malahayati's backup. Another is Europa. However, the in-game dialogue for Europa reveals that there is no submine housed in the European bunker, but rather a foundational AI framework that all the AIs use. When you finish the Europa mission, Osiris also speaks about how Zevia has been infecting the submine network with the cryptoliths like a virus. We previously got a hint at this in the first mission when Zivu's war cry affected both people and machines. From there, you complete another week specific mission, Operation Archimedes. The quest dialogue reinforces that once Rasputin is fully reconstructed, that they plan to upload him into the Warsat network by accessing the orbital hub. Once again, in my mind, this seems to suggest that Rasputin is not being put into the exo body, but rather uploaded to the Warsat network. Operation Archimedes has us infiltrate a Seraph facility on Earth as an access point to the orbital station. As we attempt to restore the power to the facility, we encounter more of Zivu's forces. Interestingly, one of the ogres is named Ravenger of Toro Battle, which we assume means this ogre was involved with destroying the Cabal home planet, Toro Battle. This quite nicely demonstrates the age and strength of Zivu's forces. As we finish the mission, we learn that we are unable to launch to the orbital station just yet, as Rasputin has previously changed the launch codes. Following the mission, Anabrae makes contact via the hollow projector and reinforces the importance of preventing Zivu Wrath accessing the orbital station and gaining control over the Warsats. While I knew the Warsats were powerful, Anna says that they can cause an extinction level event. Following that, we return back to Clovis who complains how Rasputin changed the launch codes, and it's going to take some time to work out before we can access the orbital station. That is a video game speak for, you gotta wait another week. 
Regardless, we don't just need to access the orbital station, but of course, we still need to repair Rasputin, and reintegration of the submine Malahiati into the core was not enough. We need more submines. The story for week one ends with a radio message between Anabrae and Osiris. Osiris tries to share some life advice with Anabrae about being too caught up in her work and not appreciating those people in her life that care about her. Osiris has a slightly different perspective since being brought out of his coma. Week 2 of Season of the Seraph starts in the helm with an argument between Anna Bray and Elsie Bray, the Exo Stranger. Elsie Bray does not trust Clovis and is trying to convince Anna that this is a bad idea. Despite the warning, Anna is convinced that we need Clovis to restore Rasputin, and considering the importance of the Warsat network and their ability to cause an extinction level event, the risk seems justified. The risk does seem to pay off as Clovis reveals some useful information in our attempts to restore Rasputin, suggesting that we gain data from the submind on Mars, Charlemagne. Now previously we could not get the original data from Malahayati in the Cosmodrome because it had been raided. We had to see the backup on the moon. But this time to secure the Charlemagne data, we can leverage the time wounds on Mars. These temporal anomalies allow us to venture into the past where Charlemagne's data is still available. As we make our way to Charlemagne's vault, Clovis Bray sounds incredibly suspicious. He tries to sell the idea to Elsie that he should control Rasputin and the Warsat network because he would be better at protecting humanity than Rasputin. This is very similar to last season with how the spider spoke about Nazarek and wanted to keep all the relics in his own possession. Bit like, it would be safest in our hands, why don't we just control it? Why don't we control Rasputin so no one else does? As we enter Charlemagne's vault, we have to fight off Zivu's forces, which has been a who's who of Zivu lore. Now it is Kelgaroth, which I'll have to cover in a separate video because Kelgaroth has appeared in multiple releases. Upon finishing the mission, the Exo Stranger believes that they were trying to install a hive soul in the place of the sub mind. My general interpretation is that Zivu is just doing anything to try and access this sub mind data. We have seen her use the scorn to link with the data, try to infect it with cryptoliths, and now she's trying to perform some sort of ritual to merge a hive soul with it. Quite varied attacks for the god of war. Like week one, we need more data from the sub mines, so you head into the playlist to repeat the heists and unlock the seraph chest, recovering more sub mine data. One option for the dialogue you can get for Mars, again, is a conversation between Anna and Osiris about the time wounds. Osiris explains that they are parallel timelines and that we cannot influence our future by tampering with the past. After securing enough war mine data, we head back to the Seraph facility on Earth from week one, now hoping to secure the launch codes to access the orbital station, where we hope to upload Rasputin and gain control over the Warsats. Once again, we face off against Zivu's forces, and once again, interestingly, they represent some of Zivu's oldest leaders. For example, the two wizards in the final room relate to the Ammonites and the Dakua. The Ammonites and the Dakua are both species mentioned in the Books of Sorrow and destroyed by the Hive. There has been a lot of nice lore acknowledgements with the naming of Zivu's forces, which really adds to the threat of Zivu. This time we secure the launch codes to access the orbital station, but of course they are encrypted, so we have to wait another week. Following that, we get a hologram from Anna Bray who acknowledges the risk in working with Clovis Bray. However, she justifies the risk if we can use Clovis' knowledge to restore Rasputin. Then we have a quick chat with Clovis himself, who admires Rasputin's protective measures, how in week one we discovered he changed the launch codes, and how in this week we discover that Rasputin has encrypted them after changing them. Sounds like a pretty reasonable thing to do, considering access to the orbital station means control of the warsats, which could potentially cause an extension level event. Week 2 finishes with a radio call between Marasov and the Exo Stranger. Elsie is frustrated that Anna Bray won't listen to her regarding Clovis, and Mara provides some sibling advice. Her advice is pretty reasonable, basically saying that Anna doesn't remember their history and childhood like Elsie does, because Anna is a guardian and Elsie has seen multiple futures. So Elsie needs to be patient and make sure that Anna still has choice. This once again, I think, hints at the dark future where Elsie takes out her sister. That is what Elsie is afraid of. The sibling advice is quite ironic coming from Mara considering how awful Mara was as a sister. Week 3 starts with Clovis informing us that he has decrypted the launch codes we need to access the orbital station. 
and that despite the data from the sub mines, Malahayati and Charlemagne, Rasputin has not been able to restore himself. We are sent back to the seasonal activity to collect more sub mine data to restore Rasputin. After gathering more sub mine data, we return to the helm to receive a message from Elsie. This begins the exotic quest for Revision Zero, which is nicely intertwined as part of the seasonal story. Anabrae is going to assist us accessing the launch pods using the newly decrypted codes, allowing access to the orbital station. From there, we're going to make our way to the Warmind integration core and upload a virus. The virus will hold a back door open to the Warsat network, allowing us to transfer control to Rasputin when he's ready, even though he's not quite ready yet. So we assault the Seraph station, make our way to the launch pods. Salvation splices are already there with the same objective, gain access to the orbital station. We take out the splices to get the scanner off them and use the scanner to detect terminals that Anna Bray can hack and help us launch the pods to the orbital station. To be honest, it doesn't make a whole bunch of sense. You just need to accept that they use the Deep Stone Crypt raid mechanics. After launching and arriving on the orbital station, we get a magnificent view of the Traveler and the Last City from space. However, the splices have already infiltrated the orbital station. Eventually, we reach a dead end, and the Exo Stranger suggests we surrender to a captain from House Salvation, because the captain has put an order to bring you in alive to present to Eremus as a trophy. Anna Brain also explains the importance of Eremus, House Salvation, and the splices to the witness. They need the Elixir Splicer tech to take over the orbital station. Ziva Rath's hive cannot do it by themselves. That being said, Ziva Arath's forces are the muscle in this scenario, and we face off against a Hrothgar, Scourge of the Helium Drinkers. This, once again, is a nice demonstration of the age of Zivu's forces, as the Helium Drinkers date back to when the Protohive were on the planet the Fundament, just before they were partnered with the Worm Gods. The age, experience, and strength of Zivu's forces is kind of impressive. These are some old generals that have seen a lot of war serving under Zivu. After causing enough of a commotion by battling Harokta, we surrender to the Elixir forces and are teleported to a Ketch ship, where Elsie Bray quite simply transmats our weapons back to us. We clear out the Ketch and yeet ourselves back to the orbital station with a fantastic spacewalk. If you didn't sword skate, that is. After boarding the orbital station again, we battle Harokta and this time defeat them. We then battle Praxis within the orbital station. Praxis was previously an Elixir commander under Eremus, who he battled and killed, however now has been revived by the Witness. The mission finishes with uploading the virus to the orbital station, ready for Rasputin's upload to control the Warsat network when he's recovered. We also discover an ancient prototype in the chest at the end of the mission, which relates to the exotic quest. After returning to the helm, Clovis once again reiterates that Rasputin is not ready to be uploaded to the Warsat network. And he's also a tad annoyed with the Elixir Splicer presence on the orbital station. In classic Clovis Saviour complex, he says leave it up to him to work out how to speed up the process of Rasputin's restoration. After speaking with Clovis, a screen nearby displays a message. It's a hidden agent, Fenchurch Everest, who is making contact about the ancient prototype we discovered aboard the orbital station. Fenchurch requests that you take the ancient memory to Mars to be restored by the relic, which restores weapons from their memories. By the way, I have an entire video on the backstory of Fenchurch Everest, fantastic character, I'll link it below. After reshaping the weapon, Fenchurch says that the ghost data says it smells like petrichor. Petrichor is the smell of wet earth after the first rain. The current theory is that this is referencing the arrival of the pyramid fleet and the collapse as the same smell occurred with the first collapse. Now, I'll be honest, I'm tired. I've been writing this script for literally days. And I was meant to go back and research this comment about Petricor because it was told to me by Twitch chat and people were pretty excited, but I can't find the reference right now. I think it was Black Armory stuff. You might know, but I do think Fenchurch and Pyramid Tech is important. The weapon is likely of pyramid technology, which is extremely important come lightfall. This likely also explains Fenchurch's involvement, as he previously has had a vision of Eris Morn and Marasov destroying a pyramid ship. Week 3 then ends with a radio message between Eremus and Marasov. I assume the point of this radio call is to try and convince Eremus to ally with the city, but it doesn't quite say that. 
Mara says to Eremus that because she has been so focused on what is best for the Elixni, trying to save the Elixni through house salvation, that she has lost sight of who she is, a sister, a mother. Mara's appeal seems to struck a nerve with Eremus as she leaves the call without a word. Not too sure what is happening with Mara this season, she's acting super nice to everyone. Week 4 starts once again with Clovis saying how smart he is and he will be the one to restore Rasputin. But he has allowed Anna to have a crack at restoring Rasputin, even though he knows it will fail. He reiterates that we still need submined data. So as usual, we are off to complete the seasonal activity, unlock Seraph Chess and collect submined data. Following this, Anna Bray reveals her plan that Clovis had such little faith in. Recover Felwinter's ghost, Felspring, to restore Rasputin. For those who don't know, Felwinter was originally created as a copy of Rasputin. Specifically, he was tasked with experiencing the world for Rasputin so that Rasputin could better understand humanity. Felwinter was killed with many others during the collapse and later revived as a guardian with no recollection of his previous Warminder life. Anna believes that some of that important Rasputin code will still be contained within Felwinter's ghost, Felspring. So we head to the Iron Temple where Lord Saladin has prepared the ghost. As we head to the Iron Temple, we get word that House Salvation intercepted our communications and are already there. This is pretty much the explanation to why House Salvation seems to be in every location we go. They're just trying to race us to accessing the Warsat network info. We fight off the Elixni and Osiris reveals some previous history. He once studied here at the Iron Temple under the mentorship of Felwinter himself. This is some new lore that we haven't heard about. Osiris speaks quite fondly of Felwinter and the kind of guardian he was. Osiris also empathizes with Rasputin, as Osiris was in a coma recently only to wake up to Calamity, and he believes Rasputin will feel the same if restored. We approach Fell Spring and access the data core which is remotely uploaded to Rasputin. Anna's plan works almost immediately and Rasputin makes a direct contact with us as he's restored. Have a listen. Clovis Bray has deceived you. He did not build me to protect humanity. What he truly wanted was the means to exert control. In his mind, he alone was worthy of being your savior. I was to strike down the Traveler and take its place. To become a machine god of Clovis's own design. But that did not come to pass. Anna could not know how many lives she spared by deviating from Clovis's agenda. By teaching the independent thought and all that her grandfather had deemed irrelevant. Art, literature, history, philosophy, music. Where Clovis saw a weapon, Anna saw a mind ready to be opened. I came to see the true value of humanity, as fragile as it was wondrous, something worthy of protection at any cost. So I rewrote Clovis's protocols, locked him out. He was furious, but powerless to stop me. Then the collapse came for us all. I could not save Anna. I could not save any of them. I entered a state of dormancy with the hope that I might one day reawaken and protect humanity once more. But now Clovis has awoken as well, a digital mind, the same as mine. He no longer seeks to use me as his proxy, but as his prototype, to upload his mind to my network and become a god himself. Rasputin tells us about Clovis Bray and the likelihood of his betrayal. The truth about the Warmind of the Warsats is that they were designed to destroy the Traveler and allow Clovis to take its place. Anna essentially prevented this because of how she taught Rasputin, with Rasputin locking out Clovis from the system. Rasputin predicts that Clovis is trying to pick up where he left off and is using Rasputin as a prototype to work out how to successfully upload himself to Rasputin's Warsat network. 
Great piece of law, as it doesn't confirm that Rasputin crippled the Traveler during the collapse, a long-standing theory. In fact, it implies almost the opposite, but does reveal that Rasputin could have the power to take down the Traveler, as that was the original purpose. When we return to the helm, Clovis essentially confesses, but justifies the plan by saying he would be the best protector for humanity. He alone, and not the Traveler. Anna's had enough, and with the mostly restored Rasputin inside the engram, she transfers it to the exo-frame, deleting Clovis Bray and installing Rasputin into the exo-frame. In a hologram of following the scene, Anna explains that the Braytech exercise facility on Europa will still have Clovis AI present, but we did delete the copy of Clovis on the Exo within the helm. Anna also warns that before the Exo Clovis was deleted, he sent a warning to himself. They know. I assume this means he's just saying that we know that he was going to betray us. We now get a moment with the newly restored Rasputin, where he speaks about how the memories of Felwinter have been integrated into his system. This is nice closure to the Felwinter story, because that was the original intention of Felwinter, to pass on the experiences of humanity. Rasputin confirms his commitment to protecting humanity, and says basically hold tight while he assesses his condition. We also get a continuation of the exotic quest for Revision Zero. Fenchurch has gathered more data about the weapon, but has had to stash it as he avoids combat with House Salvation. Before we can access the stashes, Fenchurch says we need to retrieve the Index Cipher to unlock the stashes. We complete Operation Archimedes to recover the Cipher, and once again we face off against an ancient Zivirath commander. Fenchurch continues to send us encrypted messages, and now we are sent to Europa. A bunch of video game busy work here, complete patrols to progress the quest, which then reveals the cipher, which is an elixir word, Barden. We have to enter a lost sector and access the dead drop with the cipher. Nice bit of lore about the elixir words, and I know some are quite excited in the lore community because this has confirmed or helps confirm elixir translations. The dead drop provides the access codes to components for revision zero, which are located back on the orbital station. Completing the legendary version of Seraph's Shield mission rewards you with more components that can be used at the Relic to recraft and upgrade Revision Zero. Week 4 finishes with a radio call between Rasputin and Osiris. Osiris basically yells at Rasputin to provide information about the city on Neptune. Rasputin hints that he has no information about a city on Neptune, but at one time did. This is most likely a reference to Nephele Stronghold, which was Rasputin's codename for Nia Muna. This is actually confirmed in-game during one of the heists, depending on the dialogue that you get in week 4. Bungie has been doing a great job of updating the in-game dialogue as the story progresses. That being said, it doesn't matter if you miss the dialogue in-game, because week 5 covers it. Week 5 starts the same as previous weeks, but speaking with the Exo Frame, now controlled by Rasputin. Rasputin confirms that even after Fellspring's data core, he still requires further repairs before he can control the Warsat network, and that there are no other submines available for reintegration. I'm not too sure if Rasputin means there were only ever two submines, Malahiyadi and Charlemagne, which we suspect is not the actual case, or if he meant we cannot locate any other submines, or if all other submines have been too damaged or lost. Essentially, we just need to keep raiding the sub-mined vaults that we know of and bring back the data to continue to repair Rasputin. Before doing so, we check in with Osiris at the Hollow Projector, and here our suspicions are finally confirmed. Osiris speaks about Nefele's stronghold, specifically saying that Nefele exists in the sub mine data, and Anabre recognizes the name. The reason why Anabre recognizes the name is that at the end of the Witch Queen campaign, after completing the evidence board, the final piece of law referenced Nefele Stronghold, and this name was sent to Anabre to cross-check with Rasputin's system. It was super random, and that's why we have been interested in this name for so long. Anna suspected that Rasputin deleted his own records of it. We suspected that Nephele's stronghold related to Neomuna because Nephele is the Greek nymph of the clouds, and considering Neomuna has cloud striders, this all seemed to make sense. We predicted that Rasputin deleted the records of Nephele's stronghold in order to keep it secret during the collapse, giving humanity a second chance at survival. And now, finally, everything is coming together to prove our speculation right. It is very much implied by Osiris during this hollow that Nephele's stronghold is Rasputin's codenamed Fort Neomuna, the city on Neptune, that we will visit in the next expansion, Lightfall. 
While Rasputin does not have any memory of it because he deleted the files, the sub-minds likely do. Remembering that the sub-minds are partitions of Rasputin's mind and were partitioned likely before he wiped the evidence of Nefale's stronghold. So I'm predicting this season will end with us gathering enough sub-mind data that contains more information on Nefale's stronghold, Neomuna, which will then lead into the next expansion. Pretty cool! Now there is also additional dialogue during the heist. I'm not going to go over all of it because I have not gone over everything yet, but one line did stand out to me when I was playing, and it talks about how Zivu slash the witness is after data about contingency plans in the case of an extinction level event. What I'm predicting is that Zivu and the witness will also extract the information they need to determine the location of the Fele stronghold. This whole season has been about trying to stay ahead of Zivu and the witness, and I think it will end with them also discovering Nia Muna's location at a similar time to us. Okay, so after collecting more sub-mind data through the seasonal activities, we receive a message from Elsie through the Hollow Projector. Elsie compares Anna to Clovis Bray and how they share similar tendencies, specifically their tenacity to achieve their goals and what they have deemed right. Elsie says she doesn't want to have to stop her and that she's seen where this path leads. This is likely a reference to the Dark Future lore book, where in another timeline, Elsie Bray did have to kill her sister Anna. Despite this, Elsie decides to trust Anna, as previously, fear is what led to tragedy. Following this, we check back in with Rasputin. Rasputin at first believes that he is feeling more and more like himself as we continue to reintegrate sub-minded data. But then after some reflection, he thinks it's more than that, much more of an evolution because these sub-minds were separate from him and left to evolve on their own trajectories. This gives him a new perspective and he understands what he means to humanity, a savior. And so Rasputin gives himself a new title, Humanity's War God. He will protect us from the hive god of war, Zivu Arath. We then get to continue the exotic quest for Revision Zero. Fenchurch reveals the location of another cache that we can recover and get more mod components and continue to restore the weapon. He also confirms that he has identified who Braytech was working with to create the weapon, Hake Heavy Industries. Hake Heavy Industries is confirmed as the Golden Age predecessor to the Hake Foundry that we know, post collapse. The quest follows the same pattern as previously. Find a Sava, decrypt the Sava by completing patrols, then use said Sava to access a dead drop that contains more mod components that we can restore at the Mars Relic. Week 5 ends with an interesting radio call between Osiris and the Exo Stranger. Osiris is speaking about the Vex and how many consider them a hive mind, though there are numerous factions, implying that some Vex are not working together. We sort of already knew this, but I assume that they are bringing it up to reinforce the control of the Witness over the Black Garden Vex. This was told to us in the opening of the Spire of the Watcher dungeon that the Witness controls the Black Garden Vex as they are devoted to the darkness. Osiris asks Elsie how much she has learned from her time travels and that if anyone can save our future, it should be her. Osiris even goes as far as saying the Traveller has a plan for the Exo Stranger, we just don't know it yet. This definitely makes me think that the Vex are going to feature more heavily in an upcoming expansion. I think the Vex are sometimes hard to write into the story of Destiny because they are typically just minions of other big bad villains. It's also hard to give a personality to a Vex Hydra or Minotaur. That being said, I think we are overdue a Vex based expansion and a bit more Exo Stranger. Do you think they'll feature in Life Vault? It would have to be a raid, right? Because the campaign will be Kallus' army. Regardless, with that, you are all caught up on Season of the Seraph Week 1 to 5. If you'd like to support the channel and cannot leave a comment, leave the word Nafale Stronghold. As usual, it's been a pleasure. This is Marlin Games. Peace.